You know what she'd do? She'd sanctify them. When they could walk, she would carry them around. I mean, she said, I put up with that when you couldn't do it, but now I need you to be on your own. She said, I'm That's the way God does. Amen. He put up a lot of things you when you first got in. I believe this convention, he said, a lot of stuff in you now, I'm tired of it. I'm get rid of it. But the wonderful thing about it, he never convicts of anything he won't take away. He never deals with anything in your life that you can't be free of if you will. And after he's dealt with it, if you hold on to it, it can become willful and finally lead to where there's no place back. Yes, sir. It can lead to that. Well, the final message I, I've held for this, the only solution. We've talked about where we are, where we're going, talked about what some things, and I want to deal with the only solution. Go to read in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. You can quote it, but we won't do that. We'll read it. If my people, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, if my people which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, heal their land. Father, thank you for the reading of the word of God and for the preaching of knowledge to speak as the oracles of God. Let this word go forth free. Let us hear it in the name of Jesus. Now, getting into this message, first of all, God said, made it very plain, if my people will, I will. That simply says, if you want, I will. If we refuse the altar, he refused to listen. Israel, God said, I'll do, I will, I will, I will. Then he said he couldn't do it for them because they never inquired of me. So he left it up to us. The responsibility of seeing the kingdom of God come to earth is with the people that will pray. Always, God left it. If you will, I will. If we refuse to obey him, he doesn't work for us. Also, there's two things. He said, if they'll seek my face, that's one thing, and turn from their wicked ways. That's not repetition. He's not being redundant. To seek God's face is to seek the very presence and, and life of God. To turn from the wicked ways is to turn from what you are. And not just turning from adultery, it's turning from that which adultery comes out of. So you turn to the presence of God, seek the presence of God, turn away from what you are, and God said, I'll hear from heaven. I'm not going to hear from heaven as long as it's you and your carnal self down there pleading. I will come when you put that out of the way, and it's not you now, but that spiritual man that's coming. Now, there'll be no revival nowhere until there's renewal in that church. There's nothing going to happen in the street till it first happens in that upper room. There's got to be a vessel prepared in every revival. All along, God's made this clear. We've all, in the Old Testament, the early and the latter reign, we knew that was typical of the Holy Spirit. We knew that, but it's very real there. God said when he's taken Israel into that land, he said, I'm taking you to a land, not like a land you come from, where you watered it with your foot. They had those irrigation things out of the Nile, and they watered it. It was a human effort to water that land. But said, this is not like this. I'm taking you to a land of hills and valleys that's going to be watered with the rain of heaven. But then he said, if you will obey my commands, keep my statutes, I'll give you the rain in its season. That's sovereignly my business. But if you will, be prepared. But he let us know, if there don't no rain come, when the, when the latter rain time comes, and no rain comes, don't point no finger at me. It was you that closed the heavens, because you refused to do what I told you to do. Now we keep that in mind. As we deal with this thought, 
There must be a renewal in that church. Closing our eyes to the situation will change nothing. You know, Saul had married strange women trying to keep peace in that land. I saw preachers do the same thing. They married the strange details and details trying to keep somebody happy in that church when he'd been a thousand times better off than left in the first place. But all of that, we, we compromise, we, we, we adapt. That's the word I'm looking for, adapt. We become great adapters. Amen. But what we've done is married those strange women trying to keep some kind of a peace. He lost it all because of that. So did and so have we. Most preachers believe that individual Christians are weak and powerless and simply need to be fed some wholesome spiritual diet. That's, that's pretty well what you hear. But what you must see is that the church generally is sick and spiritually deceived, and this is the cause of Christian weakness. That's the whole cause. It's because the church itself the Bible talking about a time it becomes so weak that children come forth to the birth and there weren't enough strength in the church to birth those children. God said that. Now, the weakness of the individual is due to the willful sin in the system. The things we allow. I'm not talking about those far out liberal folks. I'm talking about what we tolerate inside the church itself. We refuse to repent of our prayerlessness. You know, I learned a long time ago, if I wake up in the middle of the night, one or two o'clock in the morning, and there's nobody trying to break in, no noise, no, I'm not hurt nowhere, don't have to go anywhere, that God woke me up, wants to talk to me. And if you'll listen, you'll hear things then that you may never hear because you're quiet enough. One such a night, I woke up, and I said, lay there, kind of wondering what's going on, uh, this thought coming to me, how many people, some of you think in hell, because you haven't prayed like you ought to pray? How many people you believe are in hell, because you haven't prayed? I told you when Zion prevails, sons and daughters will be born. I'm telling you folks, that requires repentance. You don't just say, I'm going to try to do better. You can't do better. It isn't the best you can do. It's a matter of you getting in that altar and coming before God. The church is not going to be renewed until we repent over the neglect of the word of God and the prayerlessness. We can see all the adultery. We can see all the drunkenness. But you don't see that lack of prayer, that lack of laying the hope of God. But all of the machinery of heaven runs. I said, heaven, close this up. A close look will reveal that the greatest sin that caused the sickest state of the church is a sin of prayerlessness. That is the cause. Nothing so reveals defective spiritual life in a ministering congregation as a lack of unceasing prayer. Nothing. I told you Mr. Bunyan said, he that's not a praying man is not a Christian man. And nothing so reveals the lack of Christian character is a neglect of that altar. If a man loves God, he won't talk to God. Nothing so shows your attitude toward God as when you kneel. When you kneel down before God, you say to him, I'm helpless. Unless you build this house, it's vain work that I'm doing. But that man that neglects that altar is saying to God personally by his action, I don't need you. I can do the work. You call me, just leave me alone with it. It's pretty well the attitude of the non-praying man. The only power for a new prayer life and an entirely new relationship to our Lord is the answer. That's the only answer. And this will never come till we confess and repent of neglect of the altar of God. If my people will call on me, if my people will humble themselves, if they'll turn from what they are, seek my presence, I will hear from heaven. I will hear the Lamb. That's a statement of the Almighty. 
the church of the 21st century as a whole is suffering from the lack of the Pentecostal spirit. We're only Pentecostal in name. Most part, we're not Pentecostal in action. I've said all along the line, there are exceptions to the rule. Wherever that man of God is faithful to the word of God, there is, but it's few and far between. But Mr. Bolingbrook said on one occasion, just before the Wesleyan revival broke out, he said, I have searched London in vain looking for a gospel church. I have people, and we have people call from all over this country. Do you know any place up here where there's a church? There's a lot of things with signs on them. But is there any place where God is at work and where God is real? I, the suffering is a lack of that Pentecostal spirit. Now, in view of the worldwide opportunity to reach the lost, the question has to be asked, why? Has the church been able to enter all of those open doors? Why have she been able to walk in to those places? The world seemed like open to us in this hour. The ability to respond to the call of God depends entirely upon the spiritual condition of that home church. If we're going to send forth labors, there has to be a church to produce those labors. Amen. Now, we set forth a lot of things that they call themselves labors. I, I've been around this world. I run into missionaries. They're out there just because they couldn't make it over here. I don't take away from the Greek ones. I take nothing away. I can tell you they're out there. They're, they're out there because they couldn't make it here. All they're doing is sitting out there, abiding the time. But you, you can pray to you fall day after, for God Almighty to send forth labors into the harvest. But unless there's a spirit-filled church to produce those labors, there's no way to send it. The region of this world, then, depends entirely upon the spiritual condition of God's church. As we face the challenge of the day, we know well the fundamental difficulty is not men, of, not, not of men, not of money, not of machinery, but of spiritual power. Amen. The fundamental problem is a problem of spiritual power until it's more general consecration on the part of the members of the local church, there's no hope of making Christ known to the heathen. In it that we just need to call more prayer meetings, we need more people that would pray for God's sake. And I don't have to tell you to come pray, but that becomes a habit of our life, that prayer becomes a tool and a habit must demonstrate Christ alive. He must be allowed to live in and through that body. As men of God, we must first examine ourselves. We must examine our own consecration. We will never take people further than we are. You will never move beyond what we are. So there must be a very careful examination of what we are. Our consecration to God is going to determine the consecration of those people. A praying pastor will produce praying people. A dedicated man of God will, will produce dedicated men and women. A given preacher will produce given people. There has to be that at the end. God does always have that example. And so we must first examine ourselves. Then we must bring the church, amen, to understand that it is their lack of faith and half-hearted consecration that's keeping us from reaching this world. We must bring them to know that. But I can't bring them to know that unless I myself have stood up to be that. Unless I threw everything into the battle, I have no right to ask anybody else until I give it all, I have no right to ask any man. Sometimes you see it looks like almost we feel like we're exempt from it. 
if God's will and teaching, if, if God's will and the teaching of all nations is to be done, there must be a spiritual revolution in the members of our churches. They must be broken that you're not saved but giving God an hour and a half your miserable life on the Sunday. He's not interested in that. He has one son, one life. All of my life, you know, God calls us the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. I married a beautiful lady 57 years ago, and we've been together all these years. And I used to wonder, I, you know, there, there's nothing, she's all lady, you know, there's, you, you, you never mistake of anything but a lady. She's not a masculine nothing. Amen. I used to wonder, how could such a pretty girl ever be a son of God? How could such a lady be such a son of God? Then God showed me, I've only got one son. I'm revealing, he looks better than her, he doesn't me. That's what makes us sons of God. To be led by the Spirit, the Spirit simply means Christ is seen in that life. That is the Son of God. Those that are led, we must come back to them. I said, we must come back from the pulpit to every member. We must be obey the command of God. Be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Be filled with the Spirit. And make sure that it's a Pentecostal full. Amen. Today, we've got all this such a widespread thing that, that, that you don't necessarily speak in tongues when you feel. This thing is spread like a fire across this country. I run into it everywhere. Well, they spoke in tongues in the Bible. And the day that that's not the evidence, they're not going to be anybody ever filled again for it. It isn't a shaking of a foot. It isn't a whopping of a jaw. It's a language that God gives me. This is the only solution. God is able and willing to save a world that's already been redeemed at Calvary. I mean, as far as God is concerned, six billion people have been redeemed. All they got to do is come to Calvary. And as far as God is concerned, he's able and willing. But this will happen when his professed church becomes willing for that to happen. I said, when they become willing for that to happen. You know, when God said to us, I give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him. Now we've got a we've got a thought going around. I never knew this till it was up with my good friends in, uh, in, in Florida, the hills. And, and their son was telling me he had been in a church and had got out of it. He said, you can't believe what they're doing to the word of God. They're taking the word. I'll send you another comfort. To comfort her, to be comfortable. And he's saying and preaching that that means you gotta have a lot of money, good car, big house. You know, we twist the book and try to make it what we want to make it. Amen. We, we twist it around, but we must know that to we come to the place that we're willing to give it all. When he said, give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him, we've twisted that around. I saw a man one night. He said, now everybody wants the Holy Ghost, lift your hand. They lift their hand. He said, now say this, Father, give me the Holy Ghost. They repeated that. Then he said, put it down. You've got it. He, you've got it. And I've said, if you ask, he cannot lie. Well, I was later alone with him. And I said to him, I, I knew he'd endorse that book, Angels on the Sign. And I said to him, I, I noticed you endorsed that book. He said, I don't know if I believe all of that. I said, I don't know what I'm talking about. It said on oh, now you're a graduate of two seminaries. Actually, he said three. I said, I said three. I said, you went through three seminaries. I don't know what the word ask me. Oh, you talk about it. And face brushed up. Oh, he got very angry. He said, I know what asked me. I said, no, sir. You don't know what the Bible word asks me. I'll listen to you tonight. You don't know what that means. Well, I do know. I said, no, you don't. I know. He said, tell me. I said, I've been two, three seminaries, and I can tell you what it means. If you'll read a verse for me, I'll tell you. 
read, read Psalms 2 and 8. He read it, ask of me. That's the first word, ask of me. And I'll give you heathen for thy possession. I said, who's he talking to? Well, he said he's talking to Jesus. What's that got to do with ask? I said, what did ask mean there? You tell me. It meant he had to die. That's what it meant. It meant he had to go to Calvary. If he asked for that heathen, he had to die. And if you want God's life, you've got to die. If you say you're a miserable life, you're going to miss this and all together. But if you'll die to what you are, God will give you his life. And if God will give you his life, we'll reach the world without you. But you're not going to get it. He's not coming to share his life with your life. No, two people with different wheels can't live in the same house. David can't come to the throne till Saul's off of it. Amen. Once the flesh, once the spirit. When, when Isaac was born, one or the other, Ishmael or Isaac, one got to get out of that house. And God says, if I'm going to live in that temple, then you're going to get out of it. I'm going to be the Lord of the nature. I'm going to tell you where to go and what to do here in the I'll tell you when to get up, when to lay down. I'll tell you when to walk down the road. That we have the opportunity and the means to reach the world, nobody can question. There's been enough money in this convention, if it all would pop together, to reach the world five times. I said there's been enough money in this convention to reach the world five times. The job is not done because the entire church is not in full submission to his will. Cooperation missions is important, so resources. But cooperation, if it's to lead to unity, necessitates a spiritual revival of a supernatural nature that brings me to God where there's a total, absolute commitment of not only what I am, but what I have. Amen. I'm a steward of whatever it is. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. I'm a steward over this body. That means I determine what it looks at. I must determine what it hears. I determine what it wears. I determine what it pleases God. Because I'm a steward and I'm going to answer to God. I'm, I'm a steward over whatever money's in my hand. He will one day talk to me about what kind of a steward. He's in the Bible as a steward that the, the, the man heard he wasn't being used right. And he said, you're going to give an account to me of your stewardship that you may no longer be a steward. What a frightening thought. I said, what a frightening thought that that may happen. The religions which Christianity is to replace teach her that her own life must first be built on a supernatural plane. The power of a living faith and a living God. If we're gonna if we're gonna break the back of Islam, Hinduism, and all the isms out there, we're not gonna do it with any of our humanitarian programs. Amen. No, sir. My my my, my young friend and work co-worker in India, radical Hinduism is coming to the front. They want to get rid of everything. They want now to even stop Coca-Cola and Pepsi from being there. Anything that's in America, but they're against it all. They've come into our schools in India. They've threatened to kill our directors. They've stolen our property. Hundreds of dollars worth of things. We replaced it and went on. You have to expect this. But I can tell you, hell has rose up. And if we're going to replace Hinduism in India, it's going to be because Christ was made alive through a body called the church. We're not going to do it. Well, thank God for everybody feeds anybody. I can tell you, you can go to hell well fed. Amen. You, you, you can go to hell uh, any, you know, you can be healed of it all and still go to hell. The big problem in India, the best that Josh and I have been able to talk and understand, all kinds of things. If you give them $10,000, they'll get you 100,000 people. I'm telling you, there's out there with everybody else. They've been saved 55 times. If you ever have $10,000, one man spent a million dollars, I think, or two million for a three-day, four million for a three-day campaign. Come back, said he had two million people saved in, in India. Well, not one of the persons in the church on a Sunday morning. But you know the reason?
reason why those Hindus have three billion gods and they don't care to have Jesus to them. Amen. Just add him on top of it. You say he'll heal me. But when a man stands up and says there's no other name, just this name. Amen. But this is the answer. Hallelujah. If our missionaries are to be adequately uh, prepared to convince the world, they must go forth from churches in which Christ is demonstrated to be alive. What I'm telling you, the spiritual condition of that church at home is going to determine what we do over there. We went through 10 years of the decade of harvest. I'm telling you, there's a lot of things that need to be put over there. Amen. A worldly church only transplants itself. That's all. I don't care what you are. All you can do is transplant what you are. We don't just need something called a church that people can go to on a Sunday. We need a Christ that can go and see the field that ministers to the life of men and women. That's not going to happen till my people humble themselves and pray. The perishing millions are accessible, and for the most part, he'll tell you in India, they're open to that message. Amen. If you get there, if you just get there, he told when he was here maybe last year, I don't know whether he got to tell you or not, that, but he had a Roman priest walk in this school in one of the cities of India. Just give it to him. Told him what to do with it. Went back down there. All the images are out of the church. A reformation took place in that one church. I preached through Mary out of it. I threw everything out. I'm telling you they're open. He is telling me what they, 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 they asked our students what happened to you. They're rabid. They know they can go to jail for preaching, but they preach anyway. I thought they preach anyway. There has to be that. And if we're going to reach a world, they've got to be churches that produce that kind of a people. They're not going to come out and use a friendly church. They call people pre-Christians. They're going to be people that say to you, your father's a devil. You're going to have to get right with God. It doesn't make a difference whether it hurts your feelings or not. The truth of God must come home to it. The second church that misrepresents God Almighty is a disgrace of this time. For men that know God, to sit in the church, I stay home and read the Bible. Yes, sir. For I know that with this honor, this Christ. Yes, sir. No, you're not, not me. I'm not going to sit there in something that would dishonor this great God. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, having laid down his eyes, like to redeem these millions after 2,000 years, is still waiting for the church to do the job. Still waiting on us to do what he's called us to do. After 2,000 years, the fact that Christ does, the fact that the Christ church does not have the power of consecration, which would make it possible to fulfill our task or to put every preacher in his house on his face. Amen. All to put everyone. Amen. And, 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 and in order, all to bring shame to everyone that would set in the church that would dishonor this great Christ. Amen. That would play down the only thing on God's earth. That kind of a church produce a missionary and send him over there. He's going to produce after his kind. That's all he's going to do. Nobody can produce what they're not. You only produce after your kind. So the church, if the call to prayer for revival is, is what we must have, is to be attended by God's people, and if prayer is to be affected, the state of the church must become our priority. Are oh, you listening? It must become. My house shall be called a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of prayer. It's become everything else but that. Amen. You can go to church uh, most of the time. Little prayer meeting. Uh, on the prayer meeting now, they us stand. That's God to bless the service. And somebody hasn't heard from God for months. So get up and make that little prayer. And then we'll go through the rituals of religion. Can these bones live? My God, that's a quote in my spirit. The church, I've been a part of it for 50 years, 55 years. I've watched 
to the generation. I watch what's come in. It's no longer the Pentecostal church with the total dependence upon God for the most part. I looked at the stack of bones and, and I, 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 I'm an echo in my spirit. Can these bones live? Is it possible for all of this to come alive again? Well, I get not going to come but no religious program. Not going to come but no games of religion. Thank God for some of the program they be helping somebody. Now, I'm going to tell you, a Royal Rangers program is not going to revive the world. I thank God any goodness go on. I'm not taking nothing away. I'm just telling you, we've replaced the dedication to God with all of this stuff. You know, God's man today, like Ezekiel, his faith would be impossibility. Before us is heaps of bones, and the question is being asked by God to us, can they live? Can they live? That's, that's a question I believe God is asking. We've tried to answer the question with all these so-called church growth programs. The sheep are led to believe by increasing the number would overcome the apostasy. That's exactly all of this just add more tears to us. After a while, we'll overcome all this. Well, it isn't tears, it's going to be it. It's born again, Holy Ghost filled, intercessors of God. Amen. We fail to realize that the church, in its present condition, for the most part, would only multiply the problem because everything produces that which kind. Of Amen. Amen. The meanest people you can get, you preach this. It's folks that got caught up into that stuff and don't want to get out of it. Now, you're a legalist or worse. Amen. You come preaching this gospel as it is. All of a sudden, you're the worst person in town. Amen. He, he don't even know God. He's mad. He's mean. No, just tell the truth. We close our eyes to the fact that what is true in the natural is true in the spiritual. You're only forced to grow what you're going to kill. There's only one answer to this question. The man of God must come to the place of Ezekiel and say, Thou knowest God. We must confess to him that it's gone beyond me. I've tried all the programs. Amen. I've bought all the machinery. We've had all kinds of parties. And we fed them till they're overweight. Amen. Trying to keep them in the church. Amen. We, we've gone through all of this and it hasn't worked. So I confess to you, God, I don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. This hasn't worked and I'm throwing myself on you here. Amen. I ask the question, a confession of helplessness. Ezekiel did, amen, in himself did not have an answer. He knew that. He said, Thou poorest God. I'm looking at the office site I've ever seen. Here's a mountain of bones, not just dry, but very dry. And you're asking me, can they live? I'm telling you, God, I don't have an answer. Now, as long as we think we got an answer, as long as an option, we're going to take that option. But when we come to the end of ourselves, and like you see, you, you know, God, whether can any life come into these bones or not, you're confessing, I don't have an answer, but I'm here to have an answer. Realizing it's only as we're linked with him, only as he lives his life through us, the dead bones will come alive. The church must so live as in the beginning, there's no longer the church but it's Christ. No longer. They took knowledge. We have, we, we can be done. What can be done, rather, to develop the real quality character of true Christianity? That's a question that has to be answered. What can be done to redevelop that character of that first church when this city and your city take knowledge of us that we have been with the Lord Jesus Christ? What, what is going to have to happen? Amen. We must have a revolution of a spiritual nature. Things cannot continue any longer at their present level. We've gone as far as God's going to let us go. He said, if you're so blind, we'll let you fall off of that cliff. But you must have that. The pulpit has to be revolutionized. It, become, it must become once more the voice of God. 
not the voice of consensus. Amen. Not because this one ain't going to like what I'm going to say, or this one isn't. He must become the voice of God. The pulpit has to become that if the church is ever going to return. The preacher must want hear, hear what God is saying, and he must say it without any kind of a compromise. Whatever happened to the scripture that to have no fellowship with the covetous? People wouldn't give a quarter to see a word of saying, yet we treat them like they're Christians. They're not Christians. Then we treat them like that. He said, I want those folks that cost vision that church don't have anything to do with them. But we'll give them jobs to try to keep them there. God flushes the bowels of that church. They know that the church has somebody make them a deacon. Ezekiel said, so I prophesy as I command. I went in and preached that day. It looked like no hope. It's a hopeless saying. Prophesy means he preached to them. He didn't just say, thus saith the Lord something. He said that, no doubt, but yet he preached to them. Standing here in the valley, his only company, a mountain of dry bones, his only spectator, heaven and hell, the man of God said, I did what I was told. I preached. Can you imagine what they thought? Here's a man talking to bones. Amen. Yes, sir. Here's a man. God's quest is for such a man. Man will preach to the dead. They'll never get up till somebody talks to them. I said they'll never come up till somebody talks. Till the man. I, I, I was in a fellowship meeting and I, I sat there with that night in the service. I little old church still in the tin building. That night, then during the song service, nine people got baptized in the Holy Ghost. I mean, while we're singing, we're hooked up on the I'll fly away. We sing it to we have our chinas. Nine people got the baptism. When they got through with that, received the biggest offer today that they received. I preached the gospel. Six got saved. Bring three of them through the baptism. One o'clock in the morning. Had to pour some of them out of the church. I mean, we're drunk on the Holy Ghost. Went to fellowship meeting the next morning. Good press brother got up. Said he thank God I'm saved. Man got up behind me. Leaned over me. And said, we're in the day of the fall in the way. Don't nobody want nothing. I preached in the jubilee vein. He said, don't listen. I'm going to have to borrow money to pay the bills of the church. And he sat down. And another brother got up and said, they just want to say amen to what he says. They didn't want me there in the first place. Sure didn't want me to say nothing. But I'm up without, you know, it's a reflex. You know, <laughs> you know how that works. I jumped up. And I said, it don't have to be that way. And I began to tell them what happened last night. I mean, we went home with 12 people full of the Holy Ghost, six brand new converts, biggest offering we ever had. Didn't know it, but I got out the eye. Amen. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I'm a hollering. I, I, I mean, I'm laying on the line. All of a sudden, I realized I'm the only one in here paying attention to me. They're listening. I'm the only one jumping. So ease my kid and sit down. The big man got up again. <laughs> oh, he leaned over me. If I looked up, I could see his tonsils. <laughs> he said, it's been my observation. After 40 years at Pentecost, they that demonstrate the most live the least. Man said to me, sit down. Man said next to me, said, you know he's talking about you. I said, I do. He said, don't you go get up. I said, no, he's borrowing the money. <laughs> oh, Ezekiel was a fool for God. I said he was a fool for God. Not a matter of doctrine dispute. There's a matter of life and death. So it must be with every man of God today. It must be a matter of life and death. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon them, on us, we don't just speak words. We speak life. 
we must believe that. I said, we must believe the ability to impart life is a natural result of being filled and led by the Holy Spirit. We just don't have enough faith in this Holy Ghost. When the man of Christ Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost cried, Lazarus come forth the grave, gave up its death. He had to call Lazarus' name on a thousand graves in the book of God. When he spoke, the man, the ability in part life is a natural result of this. When the man of God is continually filled, he continually imparts the life of God. Now when this man speaks, the earth melts, life flows, death comes to life. When that man speaks, this is where God brought us here to tell us the world is not waiting for a new definition of the gospel. They're waiting for a demonstration of its power. They want somebody to come full of it that can say to that broken bones, such as I have, give I you, to preach into it, to proclaim the truth of God into it. Amen. In these days of acute political helplessness, moral lawlessness, spiritual hopelessness, the man of God must rise to the occasion. He must arrive. Somebody's going to arrive. God made me know, and in our meeting with our elders and those on that Monday night, last, this last Monday, amen, it was a meeting. I'm telling you, a prophecy came forth from Brother Shoes, a man of God. If you ever met one, that skinny man that sat there all the time, he prophesied. And he said, God's hurt you. And I'm going to touch him in this meeting. I know somebody is going to leave here to rise up to that occasion. Not everybody. There's preachers going to rise up. This, this is the only thing that's worth living. Madman in the true sense. That is to say in the sense of enthusiasm, and intelligence, the sense of wisdom and fire, in the sense of conviction that neither he, that, that, that will neither be bribed or deterred. Amen. You can't buy him. He done saw something now. And no way to buy him. He sold out. But this one thing he lives. Only the Holy Ghost can produce much such men. And he'll produce them anywhere that will let him. Sad thing to me, so little young men called preaching those churches. But you get this Holy Ghost flowing, every young man got be called. You have to sort it out. There's going to be a deacon, Sunday school teacher, but he's called. He wants you to send it now. Amen. Get me out there. I'm ready to go with him. I had him all the time. I was there by the school on that front row. Amen. When can I go? When can I go? I'll tell you, preach on the street out there. I don't want you to come lick it back here in Paris. I want you to be ready. When they went, they were ready. They went forth with the fire. Man of God said, so I prophesied again. He preached one message to bones come together. He never mistook that round for revival or commotion for, uh, for, for anything God was after. Back then, us Pentecost, when the bones ran, we didn't tell off around that building. I mean, but he knew better. He never made, thought that rattle was revival. He didn't, he saw the bones together, but what good are skeletons? So we just kept preaching. Mr. Finney said the worst thing to the church is 20 minute sermons. He said, doesn't matter if a man goes to sleep, wakes up two or three times. You keep hammering, you get in there after a while. We don't get out for three o'clock for a time. Since I'm not preaching so long, I prophesy to you. Hold it on, resist it now. Ezekiel preached, prophesied to those dead. Not just a bunch of skeletons. I've seen them everywhere. They sit there, they rattle when they walk. Amen. There's no life. They sing. It don't bounce off the ceiling. It falls to the floor. When it used to rise to heaven. Amen. Their teeth shine like the dead. Probably try to sing. You watch them, they're looking all over the church. They're not even there yet. Amen. But but you can't give up. You gotta keep preaching. <laughs> Lord, you can never let a man bleed his heart out of skeleton. Amen. So he preached on. Then me, come on in boards. Well, what good is that? Amen. I've got, I've got a good looking bunch now. I've got flesh on the bones, but that's not enough. He did more than commanded the bones to live. He dealt with what caused the death. 
Christ will look at them. The death is a result of evil in the system. That's the church at law. All history bears record to the fact that God will not allow his life to continue or flourish through a vessel that becomes tarnished. I want you to go home with that. He'll never allow that life to continue and flourish through a vessel, be it individually or collectively. That's tarnished. He's too holy for that. Too holy for that. He'll deal with that. There's a long suffering of God. Samson works some miracles for a while. They saw the way out. He began to associate them Philistines and look back to it no more. That's the way this church and all the world don't look back to it anymore. Just a misunderstood friend. That's what he thought about that Philistine. He still worked a few miracles. Every now and then there's something happening. All that was doing, it wasn't their faith that done it. God just let something happen to say, if you come back here, this can be real again. If you come back from where you are, but begin to flirt with that world, come cross-eyed, try to look at both of them at the same time. More and more folks. I live here, but it don't belong here. This world is not my home. And faithfulness of God, the man's I would be a stranger on this planet. Anytime I become integrated with this world, I become an enemy of God. If it ever caught me over shooting crap with the Japanese, I was out there another three years. If it ever saw me in a crap game with Japanese, it shot me on the spot. You don't play games with these folks. We're out here to end their, their rule. We're out here to stop this. That's what God is saying to us. But yet we not only went out and played with them, we let them have a place in the house. God will always protect the remnant. Always. When the vessel starts, the river won't flow. You must come back. The greatest sin is the sin of prayerlessness. That's where the, when you left the altar, then everything begins to leave. The power's gone now. When the light is not there, then other things, other things. <laughs> begin to happen. We begin to make excuse for what one time would never be a part of our life. And one time, great convictions about those things. But all of a sudden, well, you know, we were extreme. No, you weren't extreme. No, no. You haven't learned nothing. You lost something. Why did I have been to city six, eight weeks Family invited us to dinner on Saturday night. We were so happy. We hardly had that money by then. I mean, we didn't go out no more. So we went over there on that Saturday night. Got to eat. Me and my two babies, the husband, living with her and her. They get the house, my wife, and we're having to clean up the kitchen. Eight o'clock. It's in 1956. He said to me, Pastor, no matter who's here, I want you to come smoke on Saturday night. We didn't even have a television. Probably shouldn't have a television. Turned to think, here come this six shooters shoot 25 times. With no sex, with no pornography. You know, only violence is here on one much. 30 minutes I sat there and watched that. Coming back down the road, coming home, I remember like it was yesterday. Nearly, it's 48 years ago. And I was weeping, driving that road, my heart was saying nothing. God said to me, how dare you watch that trash tonight and deal with my people's eternity in the morning. Watch an X-rated movie in the pulpit on the Sunday night. Let's stand. Let's ask God. One more time. One more time. 